school um, it teaches kids social emotional intelligence because in these low income areas they really don't know how to um, feel their emotions, talk to other people, um, and build themselves as a whole. So we try to do that and also uh, provide a regular curriculum for them as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're also uh, global corporate accredited. So we've been to India and a couple other countries to uh, partner with schools over there. Yeah. Especially, so they don't really know how to talk to people, they don't know how to deal with their emotions. Um, so we try to give them that extra push. The biggest thing we found from them is consistency. 
so they don't have them in the households right now. So if we can have our teachers and our, um, our top level, we can have consistency with them, consistency with them, uh, we're going to see breakthroughs. We already have it. Uh, so we're, all, we're our own practice uh, Yeah. So last year we started, we had one school with about five kids when we started. And uh, we ended with about 50 to 60 kids in there. Now we have three schools with about 300 kids. Awesome. Oh, so you guys are from the same foundation? Yeah. Okay.
what ages do you represent? I would say the entire family. Oh, really? Awesome. Every area. Okay, cool. What do you guys do in terms of entrepreneurship? Well, we help entrepreneurs in whatever phase they may be in. So, as long as if you're looking to start a business, you already have one that is in the business. If you're looking to sell your business, provide services in that regard, making sure that you are connecting dots that most entrepreneurs are not going to drop the facts, so to speak. And uh, we also provide access to capital. Awesome. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's what that is. Yeah, yeah. What about you guys? Uh, so, we go into the Thomas neighborhoods of Florida. Currently, right now, we're going to go across the U.S. eventually, but just right now, we're in Florida. We want to look at communities as a whole. Um, and so, we do that by building a 6 to 12 high school there, middle through high school. And uh, we're based on social emotional intelligence. So, usually, these neighborhoods, the kids in these neighborhoods don't really have the ability to communicate, control their emotions, and know what they're feeling, know who they are. And so we help provide uh, the means to learn how to do that for themselves, but also uh, having a bring uh, curriculum. And so if they need to, if they're coming from uh, a lot of these kids have failed out of their other schools, been kicked out for various reasons, um, we can help them get back on track. So with our school system, they can graduate in three years if they're really motivated, maybe two. So that's really like the top. Um, it's all kids, but uh, yeah, so we really just provide them a chance to get back on track and have a future that's going to be good for them and the community of the world. Yeah, so we're looking at like these communities don't have a lot of businesses coming into it, and so there's not a lot of jobs. And that's because there's not the skill set to have a job, to have the company there. So we want to build these kids up and be able to go back in the community and have the businesses come back in, and that's how we're going to build it. Because if we train them to have the skill set to be able to work and uh, have these certain jobs. Oh, yeah. Make that case because you know, a part of our uh, our justice division, our community justice division, focus on restorative justice. So establishing healthy relationships with our youth and law enforcement, with our youth and peer peers, with our youth and their educators, and we really take them in. They do life skill classes, the entire gambit, making sure that they are also on the right track. Sometimes if they may have had an incident or two that is not you know, punitive, I'll say. Yeah. And that's where our big Yeah, so we're actually our founder and owner, um, he'll be here today later. Um, but he's a uh, sheriff deputy. And so we bring in guest speakers all the time for the kids to see like what actually is going on. You know what I mean? So like we just get cops and like um, law enforcement. Um, so we like actually get them to interact. Um, we had the head of the FBI from Florida come in uh, the other day. So like they actually get to see they're there for them, they're working for them, they're not working against them. Right, right, right. So like going back to law enforcement. Absolutely. Yeah. So we host a form of project, the Operation Justice Project. We have it every year, and it is a community forum where we invite everyone to come together and they talk about real issues. So last year was breaking barriers. How do we come together and break barriers between our youth and law enforcement and different sectors? How do we even get everyone on the same page? And to know we're working together, yep. not against each other. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. We have to speak more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. We definitely have to speak more. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you have, let's see, um, so I've got 350, almost 200. Yeah, last year we started with 500. Yeah, so we're going to open three more schools next year. Um, making this recommendation. So there's three schools, uh, Oakland Park, Livingston, uh, Miami, and next, uh, like next school year, we'll have Hyalea, Garden, and Garden on the third. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna try to grow as fast as possible while still maintaining the structure that we have. It depends on the size. So Oakland Park is smallest in the world. The big city is about 60 students. And so we have teachers there and a couple of students. And then Color Bay, we have 150. 
like we have like two teachers, four teachers, like a whole yeah. So we grow as a business from doing it. So what's actually interesting about sport? Yeah, it's actually a sport. And we have we also have that. Um, but what's interesting about the school system in Florida right now is uh, if you go to public schools, their graduation rates are like 90%, 95%, something like that. But the reason is because um, they would have like 15% ish, but they all stayed. <laughs> so, um, so they get the kids in some charter schools and stuff like that, and then they just get back to the schools. Because the students are failing, they're like, go on the next year, and do this extra money. Yep. So those are the kids we're taking in. So they're failing, getting kicked out for fighting, getting kicked out for selling drugs, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and we try to, yeah, but like we really try to build up uh, that the foundation to be able to see what's, what's possible. Yep, we have the school curriculum. We have uh, both we have now. We just, uh, 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 that, so now we can provide them with uh, job training, uh, the ability to call in, and uh, so like, uh, how to do the interview, the resume, and all that as well. Um, like on Wednesdays, we teach you um, stuff that is public school, so I'm going to teach you. I'm going to buy a house, and I'm going to find it. Uh, uh, exactly, right? It's a good one. Yeah. We're looking at a model as well. Especially in these neighborhoods where it seems they don't even have parents with access to them. They don't have the money to pay for it. So, yeah. So, it's really interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're still trying to get into the general detention system. Well, we started in regular school. We're going to call the school and it's feeding the students. And we found that going to the one time doesn't work. So, we're going to get back to the school. Yeah, it is. We're talking about public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. We're going to get back to the public school. Yeah, one time this kid was actually left uh, after the like, session. Uh, so we're like, one time is not going to be the So we picked this out of Florida and we actually put class in the coaching place for life. And we went to work on the reason I was 10% and we bought the unit rest rate and over 80% and less than 25%. And we picked this up. Hi, everybody. Hi. Everybody's looking good. We excited for our fun-filled day. It was all looking good. Yeah, yeah, that was just like one instance. Get started. So I'm uh, Megan Topham. I'm new to the area here. I just recently moved from Texas. So, Welcome. new to the area, new to Nova, so, you know, just bear with me and work with me through this technology and everything, and anything pops up, so we'll just, we'll just be in it together. Um, so, I manage a satellite campus for the University of Texas at Arlington for the past 17 years, and in that, um, it's kind of served as its own little entity, its own little nonprofit of, how do we reach out and to our immediate community there? How can we serve the needs of that community and bridge the gap between resources and serve as a liaison connecting all the wonderful university talent with the opportunities that you know were came available within that region? And along the way too, I also ran and founded and operated a gluten-free vegetarian food truck and commissary. So that's where I honed all my sales skills. If I can sell tofu to uh, cowboys, then you know, I can, uh, I can do something right. So um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about the day. You know, I think it's going to be a very collaborative experience, interactive. We really wanted to make it an experience to where you guys can work together and we can really, you know, move forward and, and use all of our best practices to give you tools to, you know, do what you need to do out there in the field. And then I'm going to let Sal introduce himself. 
Good morning. And we are, morning. just FYI, we're kind of confined right here to this space because we are live and recording. So apologies for that, that you know, we're not moving around more. Yes, yeah, so my name is Solomon Wahardo. I go by Sal. Uh, it's not Professor Wahardo, it's not Dr. Wahardo, just plain Sal. <laughs> <laughs> He's lying, it's Dr. Sal. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so Dr. Sal was, I got that nickname from, uh, long, I'm a big martial artist and also a boxer. And so the kids in the boxing club used to call me Dr. Sal. Uh, but um, so I am new, actually, I re relocated to Florida. I was the uh, chief butcher officer over in Miami Dade back in 2005, the, the year that we had the record hurricanes. Yes, that was my introduction to Florida. Uh, I survived, I survived the, the blizzard to Pittsburgh. Uh, that's where I got my doctorate and my master's degree. So I survived the blizzard, the blizzard to Pittsburgh. And, but no, no one told me how bad the, the hurricanes were going to be, uh, and so I survived three of them with my ex-wife. Uh, and I survived the, I'm originally from California, uh, Northern California, so, so I survived the earthquakes, uh, but the, the hurricanes are totally different. Uh, <laughs> so I began my career uh, working in, for a new mayor, City of Pittsburgh. Um, that City of Pittsburgh at the time was a 30, it was about 28 to 30 million dollars in the hole annually. So uh, that was my introduction to government service. Uh, and then I ended up working for the uh, uh, nonprofit that represented the state and local budget officers. Uh, it's the Government Finance Officers of Association of uh, U.S. and Canada. So I, I was, I had, I, 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 when I was there, I helped them to redevelop, um, restructure the research uh, component uh, with my former boss. And so by the time I ended up leaving, we had like five million dollars recurring revenue. Uh, and so we brought that up. That organization now makes about 15 to 20 million dollars a year, uh, and so I've had a lot of experience in both the nonprofit and the uh, in the public sector. So I came here uh, five months ago, and I am uh, Megan and I will be uh, heading the nonprofit program. We have a new we have a new dean, uh, Randy Rosman, who likes to be called Andy. Uh, his name is Andrew. Uh, so we actually are going to uh, implement a new Masters of Science in Philanthropy and Nonprofit. It's specifically for you folks, uh, and so that's going to kick off in, uh, in in the fall. In the fall, and also uh, with that, I also want to introduce some some, some folks that, that also are helping us. Uh, one of the things that, that we're going to do is have real live case studies. So when we go to the material, we actually have organizations that we're going to apply the material to. And so I want to introduce uh, folks that we have also on an advisory board that we've we created. Uh, of nonprofit executives. Uh, part of that is um, members that, of that board include Karen and Tracy Prescott, uh, bow tie kids. The bow ties are actually from her organization. Uh, we bought them because part of the part of the money goes to their nonprofit, and so that's why you see us with bow ties. Uh, and also Jeanette Prescott from Education Rocks, another nonprofit. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we also have uh, Jake. Uh, Jones from My Power, uh, what is it? My Life, My Power. My Life, My Power. Him and Daniel also are uh, represented on the advisory board. Uh, they will be speaking later on. And so I wanted to, so uh, the reason why I'm doing that is, one is that th we couldn't do all this, any of this without their help, uh, obviously without their help. And so uh, I am very grateful for all of you to be here. Uh, one, because I have a connection to the nonprofit world, uh, but also I'm um, making sure that, uh, we're all making sure that what we give you is very practical for you. Uh, so that you get out of here with some skills and things that you may not have thought about. And so that's, you know, I'm, we're very grateful that you're here. Chase? All right. So my name is Chase Gajewski. This is my headshot. Um, <laughs> thank you. So I'm the director of the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. The majority, or really all of you, have been communicating with me the past couple weeks, either through email or LinkedIn or text message or phone calls and a whole, uh, you know, chaotic swirl of, of communications this past past couple weeks. So I just want to say thank you all to everyone um, who put up with me and who is dealing with all those emails I was sending and all the long-winded uh, messages. And I just graduated my undergraduate program from NSU, uh, Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration. Currently started my Master's in Real Estate Development also at NSU. So balancing my Master's program as well as this Philanthropy Institute. And again, this is our inaugural Fundraising Academy. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for showing up. This is such an amazing turnout. And 
I think now we're going to switch it around to have everybody introduce themselves. Yeah, and I, I know it's a big, big crew, but if we can just quickly go through and you just say your first name and the organization that you're with. And we'll just, yeah, we'll start here. <laughs> I know. Good morning, Lorraine <laughs> Bedford. I'm the Director of Development for the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County. Uh -huh. Good morning. Uh, I'm Elsa Blanco Bridgen, and I am special events coordinator. I mean, manager. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Kids in distress. Hi, I'm Larry Rothman. I'm president of Helping Adults with Autism Perform and Excel. We work on employment for people with autism. Hi. Good morning. My name is Maria Jacob. I'm also part of the Happy Organization. I'm the vice president and the fundraising uh, person in charge. Good morning, I'm B.B. Dean, the Development Manager at Children's Harbor. Michelle Flores, I am a Federal Ambassador for Federal Ambassadors of the U.S. Good morning, I'm Keith Holman, I'm Chief Philanthropy Officer, Jewish Federation of Broward County. Hi, I'm Julie Benetton, I'm the Women's Philanthropy Association. Hi, I'm Pamela Gottlieb, also with the Jewish Federation of Broward County, Senior Donor Relationship Manager. Uh, my name is Sydney. I'm the Director of the Jewish and Family Engagement, also at Jewish Federation. Representing. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the Jewish Federation. <laughs> Marketing Manager for Community Greening. We are at Environmental uh, Urban Forestry. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Donna Chen. I am with Flamingo Gardens, Botanical Gardens, and Wildlife Sanctuary. <laughs> and I'm the Director of Development and Membership. Good morning. My name is Nora Rivera, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Events for Gildas Club South Florida and Food Cancer Support Community. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Lillian Roselli with American Red Cross. I'm the Regional Philanthropy Officer for Red Cross in South Florida. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nicholas Apopoulos. I'm the Executive Director of Marine Education and Independence. Good morning. I'm Morgan Stockmeyer, Development Director for Case Center for Girls. All about brand. Shame to self plug. Good morning. I'm April Graham, the founder of America's Leading Ladies. Good morning, my name is Octavia Brown. I'm a case manager for the Urban Development. Good morning, my name is Angie Moss. I'm the founder and executive director for Hosanna for Youth. Good morning, I'm a student. I know this <laughs> <laughs>
She's the one to go to. <laughs> Hi, I'm Terry Bertrand, Director of Youth Services at Center. I am Jeanette Taylor, Executive Director of Education Box, and then I do fund development consulting. Happy Saturday! Woo! Sherry Xu, I'm working for Resolve Marine Group for profit and environment, but I'm with Mission Resolve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jake, I'm Director of Business Development for My Life, My Power Preparatory Academy. Greetings and good morning! <laughs> I feel your energy right there. My name is Nina McDowell, I'm with the Urban League of Broward County, and I am the Director of Marketing and Corporate Partnerships. It's a pleasure. Good morning, I'm Donna Marshall. I too am with the Urban League of Broward County. I serve as a Senior Director of Human Resources and Training, and we're advancing. That's right. Good <laughs> morning, my name is Darwin Allen. I am the Program Coordinator for STEM, and I am here to learn. <laughs> oh, I apologize. The Urban League of Broward County. <laughs> And I am, last but not least, Marlinda Taylor from the Urban League of Broward County, and I'm a financial life coach. We have a nice group of talent in the room, that's for sure. It's going to be a good, good program. Yes, so also, um, thank you to all of the organizations and the members that are going to be working with our students. Uh, reached out ahead of time. Some of our students are going to be pairing up with some nonprofit organizations. So, again, just a blanketed statement. Thank you to each of you who are willing to do so. It really makes a difference. Um, we're just going to start off with a few slides from Stanford <coughs> Institute of Philanthropy uh, about the national program. So, just to define philanthropy, uh, SIP defines it as empowering people to follow their passions to make a greater impact on society. Before I go forward, inside your textbooks, um, there is a folder. Inside the folder are all of these slides that you will be looking at today with some room to write some notes. Uh, you are all encouraged to write notes however you write notes on a notepad, on your computer, but we just wanted to provide these to make it a little bit simpler. Um, I think we'll go over in further detail the contents of the folder shortly. So underneath we just have some words that relate to philanthropy and 
uh, kind of build out the definition a little bit more. You can look at those on the paper. This is Denny Sanford. This is the namesake and benefactor of the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. Uh, came from a credit processing uh, background, multi-billionaire, has donated well over a billion dollars in philanthropic donations. Um, this organization that he started was mainly the, the brainchild of many nonprofits coming to him to ask for money and realizing that they were maybe not as adequately trained to handle you know, donor stewardship or how to make the proposals or how to do some of the more business side of the donor relations. And he thought that a perfect way for him to give back to the community would be to provide trainings and seminars for the folks who are doing the fundraising so that they could be more effective at achieving the results that they were uh, reaching for. Um, we also, he also started two other programs, Sanford Inspire and I can't recall the other one, but it was about emotional intelligence for students and parents. The strategy of SIP is to create a network of Sanford Institutes of Philanthropy at nonprofit organizations and universities across uh, the country. And they really just want to support and promote their fundraising educational model that you are all going to be exposed to today. The mission of SIP is to help nonprofits significantly increase their fundraising capabilities and impact through proven contemporary curriculum. <coughs> This is a quick map of our 17 affiliates. Uh, NSU is the only affiliate in the state of Florida. We are currently uh, serving South Florida directly, but we do have plans to expand out. We are a relatively new affiliate. We got started here in August, so we're about five months old. Um, as I said, this is our inaugural uh, fundraising academy, so thank you all for being a part of something new. And last but not least, just some, some metrics to bring to your attention. So SIP as, at the national level has had 330,000 hours of cumulative uh, engagement of their content. 243 Fundraising Academy graduates, that's all of you. Just to get an idea, we have, I would say 50 right now. Um, so we're about a fifth of everyone that's ever graduated from this program. So this is really going to progress the, the national um, metrics as well as really you know, shine some light on the great organizations we have here in South Florida. And as I said before, we have 17 uh, affiliates throughout the nation. And I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Topham. Thanks. And take my seat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just some housekeeping stuff before we kind of get into the meat of the day. Um, some important links, I don't know if some of you, I think some of you have seen it because you've accepted it, but there is a Canvas invitation that has been emailed to everybody so that you can get access to all of the resources for the class. Those sponsoring organizations can communicate with their partner student, and so make sure that you find that, you accept it, and then you kind of peruse through the Canvas and, and see what, what stuff's in there. But it's organized pretty well by session date, so you can have all the resources for the day. You can even pull it up for you while you're in class here so that you can follow along with everything that we're doing. Um, but if you haven't received the invitation, just shoot us an email or shoot me an email after class or let me know after class and I can send it to you again. <coughs> and then one of the things we're going to be doing in class, just to kind of, you know, it's such a large group and I want everybody's voice to be heard and, you know, to really have some good dialogue, is to use Poll Everywhere. <coughs> So if everybody can just take a moment and get your cell phone out, and then I, I wrote it over here. I don't know, sadly, sorry guys, you can't see it over there. But if you will text <coughs> Megan Topham 377 to that number, then it'll you can join today's group. You'll write it over there for me. Thank you. And so as we go through the discussion, you know, when we have questions that are related to this, that you can just text in your answers and they'll pop up on the screen so that we can all see them and, and talk about it. And if you don't want to use, the phone to me just seems the easiest way. If you don't want to use your phone, you can use your, the URL instead. <coughs> and then we did email out also a pre-survey to the non-profit participants. So if you haven't seen that, let us know, but if you could take a few minutes to fill that out as well, that'll help us as we, um, you know, gauge what we're doing today and also as we develop these programs and moving forward. It's 22333. 22, 
technology we'll work through it <coughs> but again so in canvas everything will be outlined in there for you the presentation we are as I said before um, streaming live as well as recording so we'll put the recording of today's session on there so you can access it later if you you know wanted to pick up something that you may have missed and today specifically we're going to talk about your why, like finding your why, and the importance of that. Got it? Because everybody's ding ding. You know, understanding the philanthropy landscape, you know, where, um, what are the giving sources, where are they coming from, where are they going, the ethics in fundraising. And then we're going <laughs> to introduce the fundraising strategic plan framework. And really what were all these activities and conversations that we're having in each session will help you build into developing this plan. So each session you'll have a component and then that's when we'll also use some of our um, live case study organizations to, to, de to demonstrate some of these deliverables so that you can see how that can apply to your organization. And then we're lucky enough to have Daniel Peter and Jake Jones with My Life, My Power to have a conversation with you guys later. And then more networking and lunch. We're catering lunch today, so just a fun time to get to know each other today. <coughs> All right. So starting with the why. I think imagine a world in which you know we all wake up inspired and we know and feel safe and return and return home fulfilled at the end of the day, feeling as though we are contributing towards something greater than ourselves. That is um, what the Golden Circle is about, and we're going to take a few minutes to watch this video with Simon Sinek, who really and forgive the quality of the video in the beginning. The audio does kind of get better. Everything in life is a negotiation. Minus the ads. When you cross the street is a negotiation. Getting your coffee at Starbucks is a good. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. 
And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? <laughs> totally different, right? You ready to buy a computer from me? All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures, it just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, this, uh, if you, if you, if you, um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. 
I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permute, same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight, and no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first, he didn't get rich, he didn't get famous, so he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world, and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood on line for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous 
example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk time or in a DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you, we don't need it, we don't like it, you're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, etc., etc. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, didn't, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own, and they told people. And some of those people um, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time, to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the civil rights movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed him not, him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. individuals and organizations, we know what we do. You know, I'm up here, I instruct, or as a campus director, I manage the facility and offer programming. You know, it's the things, it's what we do. And then the how, I think most of our messaging kind of st stops there at the how. 
oh, it's, it's convenient. We offer conveniency. We offer affordability. Or we offer, you know, nice structured programs for evening and working, you know, for working adults. You know, so now the why. I mean, if, if we are going to be inspired and we're going to take that message, you know, especially now with this generation and, and all the messaging that's coming out, it needs to have that emotional connection. You know, you have to start off with the why, with that, with that reason of why you get out of bed in the morning and why you do what you do. And that, those are the things that people are going to attach to. And that's the things that they're going to then take your cause and move forward with it. So, in your handouts, there's a work, they call it a workbook, but it's really a worksheet. So on the front there, you'll see this diagram. So I want you each to take just a few minutes, and after just thinking about that, and maybe what's happening in your organization right now, and some of the things that you do and say, you know, how would you clarify your why, your how, and your what? And it's not that one thing is more important than the other. Really, all three things are very valuable, and they need to balance out. Just like with every connected circle, you know, you need to make, you do need to have your core competencies and you do need to be very clear about who and what you are, but it's that component of the why that's really going to connect it to your audience. So take a few minutes, write down in your, in your workbook, and then we're going to pair off and then um, you can share your experience or your why with the partner. some questions to think about while you're jotting your, your why. Like why does your organization exist? You know, beyond the products, beyond the growth and profit, it's not about money. Money is not why. You know, why should anyone care about what you're doing? Are we just doing why or are we doing all three? All three. I mean, the other two should be fairly... more minutes to wrap up and then go ahead and pair off with somebody.
That's great. So what we talked, so what we agreed is this is, this is the business end. Yes. Partnership. So that's the end of the end that we yes. operate with every day. And it's necessary. Yep. I mean, the how and the what is re required to bring that message home. Yeah. Well, we have a different, I mean, we have a how and a what. Yeah. But you want that? Sure. To, okay. So our, our how is that we create and fund employment opportunities. Uh, we also identify <coughs> partner organizations to work with. Uh, our model is we create and fund and they operate. Mm -hmm. uh, it keeps our uh, program costs very low. Our, we actually have an under 5% overhead cost. Right. 95 to 97% goes to uh, in, 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 uh, program. Mm -hmm. And we, and we raise funds to support programs, and that's why we're here. Uh, our what is we've established workplaces. We started a uh, something we're calling Spectrum Tech with UCO, by the way. Uh, as a partner organization, we funded them. You, you partially funded them. We need to talk to you. <laughs> we really need to talk to you. But Spectrum Tech teaches people on the spectrum to be software testers and then employ them. We've started a second program in concert with Broward College to teach people on the spectrum avionics, avionics technicians, how to repair the electronics that go into a cockpit. Uh, Broward and we work together along with the University of Miami Center of Autism Related Disability to provide an autism friendly program to teach those people, and we started it Monday. Okay. <laughs> this past Monday, uh, pilot program, it's going to work out well. It's the, the demand is huge. It's almost like a guaranteed job that starts off at about twenty thousand bucks and grows. And our third thing is we created a job board, an electronic job board, that matches the skills of people with autism and only people <coughs> with autism to employment opportunities. And it's available online at no cost. So that's our app. And uh, I'm going to take a stab at this. So um, Shalva, which means peace of mind, um, translated from Hebrew to English, it leads the way in which we treat and care for families and children with disabilities. Um, they strive to restore and the family unit and provide peace of mind. The family, and this is how they do it, the families receive comprehensive care from birth to adulthood. Um, each family is paired with a therapist, and that therapist trains <coughs> the family on how to care for that child in the home. So if you come in with a kid with Down syndrome, or they're blind, or deaf, or autistic, um, you're getting the tools that you need to help that and assist that child in the home. And what we do. Um, it's a tool and a method for disability communities to follow in the world and create <coughs> inclusive communities that embrace all differences in others. Ultimately, for the ultimately the goal is for communities to see people with abil for their abilities and not and beyond the fact that they're <coughs> um, and they're doing it. They're integrating people in the community and providing jobs and providing <coughs> many out sources for resources for them and opportunities for them to come into the center. It's acting almost at the, the center itself is 220,000 square feet. It's one of the largest, most advanced centers in the world. And it has a cafe on the second floor. So people from the greater community and people who visit Israel go there and they see it as a tourist attract attraction. Uh, and so you're exposed to individuals with disabilities. You're, they're serving you coffee and they're, and you know, it's just a beautiful thing to see. So we hope and strive that to make that impression and that impact in the world um, and for others, other communities with disabilities um, all over to follow. Thank you. Nina? All right, so my why, I essentially all, I like to say that um, I'm just a young kid from Flint, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Geographic, geographically and statistically, I do not qualify to have access to education, uh, entrepreneurship, jobs, justice, and health, self-reliance, power, um, parity. And it's the Urban League of Broward County and organizations, or the Urban League of Broward County that provides transformative solutions and advances the lives of over 14,000 individuals annually, giving these individuals 
access and opportunity to education, jobs, justice, housing, and health. That's my life. <laughs> Are you raising? Yeah. Okay. We're like stretching and. <laughs> so just to piggyback off, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I do work with you, and I know that working with you, they don't really have a strong. I say mind, but they don't know what they what they're into. Everybody wants to be a basketball. Everybody wants to play football. Nobody knows being a career. So I, it hit me to my heart. So my wife are. Um, youth need mentors who care about their future. Youth need empowerment and also help through tough situations. So the overall why for that is youth have a voice that we need to hear, assess, and address their concerns. <clears throat> the how. The how is me basically reaching out to the community, just looking for people to volunteer their time, their talent, and to open up their hearts. Um, and what, what am I able to give you guys? Or what am I able to give any organization that is able to pour into these youth? By volunteering your heart, we can help promote your business. Through the Urban League's website, we can go ahead and do a spotlight and promote your company so we can attract more people to you. That way we can just show that we care about you and we care about the time that you gave to us so we're going to give it back to you and basically promote you and your business. Ladies need a sisterhood of motivators and supporters, champions and cheerleaders to help them soar and be more those I am one of those ladies. I went from being a teacher assistant to a school site administrator. And what I found was girls from young as five to women as old as 65 do not know their purpose. So basically, I help people from your ordinary to your <coughs> And I do that through a pathway-driven approach. We do a skills assessment. We determine who you are. What are your skill set? What are you good at? Once you find your purpose, your joy resides there. And I do that. That is my how. And our what is, we develop a personal leadership plan just for you. That's it. Thank you. take a little bit of a different twist because being a consultant, everything that I do is personal because um, I have to create my own job experience and monies and um, I'm very passionate about nonprofit. Um, so the why of why I do what I do and why I got into nonprofit many years ago is because I needed something to feed my soul. I worked in the corporate world. I was very good at what I did. But the more I was giving, the less I was getting. And so, um, 
you know, it was always a vision of mine. And I was brought up in the Midwest. My parents are at 88 and 85, still serve on boards. They still volunteer their time. My dad was always a big person saying, you know, we are consumers. We take, 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 and it's our responsibility as citizens of this world um, to give and to find out how to do that. And so we're all here and we all know that. We know that's our core. So that's my why. Um, of why I chose to, to live in this nonprofit sector. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from John F. Kennedy, and it comes from when the first uh, spaceship went up. You know, we don't do what we do because it's easy, we do it because we, it's hard. We make that choice. So, the reason, um, the why also that I really now am, am focusing on as a nonprofit consultant is because the work that nonprofits do <coughs> in our world is so critical. And it's so important to each individual community and the impact, whether it's dogs, cats, housing, individuals, there's not time for a learning curve. And face it, unless you're with a huge organization, if you're with a small organization, you are the, you know, you have to know best practices for HR, for accounting, for, you know, event management, you know, for everything. And there's just not enough time or intelligence in one person or a small staff to have that capacity. So that's why I do what I do. I feel like I've been really blessed over all these years to have really great experiences and really, really crappy experiences that have taught me a lot. And so what I do is I offer my services, sometimes a lot of times pro bono, um, <laughs> to nonprofits to do an asset inventory because it's so easy for us to focus on our non, our, our, our Achilles heels that we get hung up on that, that we don't focus on what our assets are. Right. And so streamlining that, going in and identifying what those assets are, what makes that, you know, your organization, or you as an individual working in a nonprofit, what is your niche, you know, how do you prioritize that? Um, and then the, the, the what is what I do, I, I really implement best practice strategies, um, ethical practices, because I too believe that everybody is extraordinary working in an ordinary world. So it's really <coughs> focusing on that and helping you identify your why. Perfect. So thank, thank you. you. Well, look at the right. difference. No, it's yeah. great. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to share? And then we can just take a quick break and then come back and. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to share mine. Yes, please. Oh, um, my why. For me, this was my story, and also I realized that I wasn't the only one. Too many people are existing in life holding on to the secret of what happened to them as a child. Mm -hmm. So as I began to identify with my own self, I started realizing it's not a child thing. It's some adults that's still existing with childhood trauma. So that's the why. The how was um, we decided to empower those that was impacted by incest, molestation, and rape to live, stop existing in life, and to live beyond what happened to them. And how is providing education, awareness, resources, and support to help inspire them, heal them, and bring back family unity. Mm -hmm.
so our, our how is that there is over 15,000 goodwill ambassadors around the world, and you can be a goodwill ambassador and run an orphanage, or you can be a goodwill ambassador who's well connected. And what we do is we bridge each other. So if you run an orphanage and you're not well connected, you reach out to a goodwill ambassador who is well connected. If you need money to, to run that orphanage to feed these children, the ones who are connected will find someone to match you with. So we can find people to fight your causes. And you also have the power to to say things out in public that you wouldn't normally be able to say in public. Because <coughs> people know that there are 15,000 people that also have the power of other people talking to you and listening to you. So they're less likely to mess with our group as a whole in, in the government, on the, on the government plane. There are people um, that are from any walk of life in our group, whether you're high up in the government or if you're just, you know, someone who, who makes objects and sells them to raise money for food. You are nominated just solely on your drive to be an advocate. If you're, if you're willing to get your life out there to change the world. And this is what the people do. So our, our what is just a group of people that are willing to put their life a little bit more on the line than the everyday people. People that, that won't come out of their comfort zone. These people actually get out there and change their personal life, their personal, personal comfort for other people. And you can't say that's little. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So a hand again. Um, again, grab some snacks out there at the restroom. You go down this hallway, take a right, take a left, and it'll be on the left. <laughs> Yes. As soon as you say, my family is a I get it. In more ways, I know. I'm gonna shine your hair. I've been. I've started here.
this fundraising strategic plan. You are going to be developing the, the um, components of it in class and activities, but it's not something that you have to do formally or that submit back to us or anything like that. That is a project for the students. So just wanted to clear that up so not everybody's panicking. <laughs> and now you're going to be like, man, why didn't we partner with a student? <laughs> So, just so you can see the screen here, it's really hard to see from the 
from there, but this is what Canvas looks like when you guys will get in. And really what you will want to focus on is just some of this getting started stuff where we'll put some additional resources. That's where the link is to the survey. Yes, ma'am. Do we have Wi-Fi? The Wi-Fi here? Yeah. Yes. 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 Complicated. <laughs> um, and then if there's a link here also to the poll everywhere. But really what you'll see is in each module for each day or each session, it's just where we'll put all the resources and course content. So if you want to go back to it at another time, you know, and you just have access to it. As well as if you want to communicate with anybody um, within the, the group here, they're all within this, this framework. And you can click on the inbox here and then shoot them an email through the Canvas system just so you can have access that way. So hopefully, and then the students, you guys, there's a module at the bottom that's specifically to your course. So that's the stuff that everybody else doesn't need to worry about, but the students need to focus on, and that's where all your content will be. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody sigh of relief. Okay. Um, quick announcement. So I just called catering, so there will be more coffee coming. <laughs> yeah. And I won't take that personally. Okay. <laughs> stuff, the nitty gritty of like what's the environment that we're in right now. So Giving USA, there's a link to this, um, the key findings in the canvas so you can click on that too to get the more robust document. But generally, it's an annual publication from Giving USA Foundation. It uh, details the trends in philanthropy, <coughs> offers analysis and economic outlooks and makes suggestions about effective strategies. Um, so again, there's a more robust version of this if you want to peruse that that's in Canvas. <coughs> but the data, so total estimated charitable giving in the United States rose 0.7% between 2017 and 2018. That was a decline of about 1.7% adjusted for inflation to about $427 billion in contributions. Uh, adjusted for inflation, charitable giving reached its second highest level ever. So where's the money coming from? That's what we want to know. So giving by individuals is about 68% of the pie and was down 1.1%. Uh, uh, foundations at 18% and was up 7.3%. Um, giving by planned gifts is 9% of giving and stayed about the same. Um, giving by corporations um, encompasses about 5% of the total um, and was up about 5.4%. Where's the money going? So giving to religion, education, public society, benefit organizations, and two foundations was down. Also giving to human services, arts and culture was down and just for inflation. When you uh, look at the pie, these organizations represent the largest pieces of the where the dollars are going, especially religion, education, human services, and health. So you're saying, you're saying that the numbers showing that it, there's a decline? The yeah, the, give, the giving to religion, education, public society benefits was down, but where the dollars, like the giving, the previous slide, mm -hmm. was down, but the money is still going to those places. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, st they still take the biggest chunk of the pie of where they're putting, where the money is going, but less money is coming in. Coming. Yeah. Giving to international affairs and environmental and animal organizations, which are both relatively small pieces, um, rose significantly at 9.6 and 3.6, respectively. Mm -hmm. All right, so now everybody get there. This is where we get to activate our poll everywhere, so everybody get your cell phones. 
what do these trends say about the larger giving? Okay, so you're just going to text. So when you started the day and you joined this, mm -hmm. that same 223333 three, three, is where you're going to put all your responses. Okay, so what do you think the giving landscape looks, why do you think the giving landscape looks this way? If you need a recap, let me know. Could you please? Yes. So the money is coming from individuals, 68%, and it was down. Foundations, 18%, and it was up. Planned gifts, 9%, and it was about the same. Corporations, 5%, and it was up by 5%. And it's going, again, to the largest pieces of the pie. So the giving of religion, education, public sector was down, but it's still the money is still going to those particular sectors. That's what I'm going to say. Okay, so let's go through some of these responses. So tax law changes. Someone tell me a little bit about that. I wish I had a microphone. Note for next class. Unless this works. Hello. So does anything pop out on this screen that anybody wants to talk about? taxes are a major driver of downward contribution. Uh, I don't I don't recall the specifics, but I believe there was something about you needed at least ten thousand uh, dollars. There's a ten thousand dollar deduction per person, standard deduction, and therefore the number of people who itemize are lower. And the incentive for people before this was that they could deduct a contribution. Uh, on their taxes, and now a very significant number of people don't want to itemize because the standard deduction is higher than their itemized items. Uh, I also think they part of that part of the reason people don't itemize anymore is they're limited to ten thousand dollars in what's called SALT, state and local tax deductions. So we in Florida are very lucky in that we don't have very we have no state tax. And our local taxes are relatively low, which means we never reach that number. Well, one important thing to think about is, you know, when we're looking at where the money's coming from and where is it going, is also within your own organization, where's your money coming from and where is it going? And how does it look like? What does it look like in relation to this percentage breakdown? You know, and to ensure that you know, 5% of corporations are giving and, you know, you have less than that, there could be potential there. And so I think it's just a, a nice way to see holistically what's happening in the environment and how your organization relates to it and how your growth can plan towards it. Yes. I think now there's just so many more nonprofits and so many more niche nonprofits where whatever you're passionate about, there is something for you to give to, and there's just more and more, so money is being spread thinner. So instead of your annual allocation of $10,000 to organization A, now you have organization A, B, and C that you want to give to, and then also people are living longer, which means they're outliving their money, so there's less um, income coming in from those planned gifts and those estate gifts, and a lot of times, those are gifts that can keep charities running for a year or more that can be put into their endowment. 
that just aren't happening anymore because people are living longer. So what do you do about that? We have to think of new and inventive ways to fundraise with our living donors. Gotta get them to give us their money while they're still alive. If you want to be organization A. Yes. yes. Um, I believe that um, we can theorize, you know, about taxes or, or things like that, but I've been also a part of a church for many years, and, and we see the money coming um, steadily and uh, substantially, and uh, I see the difference with the nonprofit. So I believe that people give where they feel that they're making a difference and there is a continuous support and commitment to a greater cause. So if they believe that they're changing something and they're part of that bigger part of the process, they will continue to support you and they'll continue to uh, bring in the money. Right, it takes us back to our why, you know? Yes, and then you see the individuals are 60% of that, right? The 68% more than companies are based anything. on our feelings. And I'm gonna throw in something there that um, the majority of donors are women. Women leave the donation at home. Where are we gonna give as a family, and how are we gonna give this year? So that's also a big point. Um, Any other comments? Okay, thank you. I think uh, in Miami, and I'm not as uh, familiar in Broward, but donor advice funds through major organizations like the Miami Foundation, which this past year raised, what, $14 million in 24 hours. And I know that that's happening in various communities around the country through Give Tuesday or what other you know, communities have established as their giving day. So going along with the aging donors, um, a lot of the donors so that they don't have to have that expense of advising their own funds um, are doing donor advised funds through those community organizations. So that definitely impacts because um, I, I'm sure all of you have, have approached maybe some small family foundations and their response is, well, we're not handling that anymore. You can you know, put your request in through X foundation. So. Going back also to the donor advice funds, what we're finding with the Red Cross is uh, the number of donations that we're getting to those instruments is really increasing. And what's happening is many, many instances, uh, Raymond James, Vanguard, whatever it is, sends us the donation but with no donor name attached, yeah, which right. really yeah. makes it hard for yeah. us to create so those the donor, yeah. the donor, and cultivate that relationship. Yeah. So it's a big area for us or looking for improvements and how we can you know, overcome those hurdles. Yes. Because in Red Cross, it has been really impactful to us. Especially when it's getting more competitive and that relationship is even more important. Absolutely, yeah. So I noticed that the two biggest sectors of giving were education and religion. <coughs> and I can't help but think that both those sectors have to have a different appeal because those sectors are going to be fine without your donation. By and large, for example, Harvard University has a $40 billion endowment. Yet people still give to Harvard every year. They give millions of dollars to Harvard. I think that's criminal. If somebody has $40 billion sitting in a bank, and, you're, and you think the best use of your, billion, of your millions of dollars is to give it to Harvard University, something is you're not making a moral calculus at this point. You don't think that that's the best use of your money. Yeah. There is something else at play. The Catholic Church doesn't need your millions of dollars. They're going to be fine no matter what. In, in fact, they could be arguing that they've been mismanaging their money for, I would argue, hundreds of years, but they're going to be fine. There is something else at play that is making these people donate to these organizations. Yeah, but it's also important to recognize that we're not all Harvards, right? Right. But so, uh, well, University of Texas has a thirty billion dollar endowment. <laughs> UT Arlington, however, does not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. 
those really, it, it is difficult, and it is, you know, especially when you talk about public education, you know, because everybody just assumes that they're being funded the way they need to be funded, and that's not always the case. The funding, state funding is going down, and then the only option there is to raise tuition unless it's subsidized in some way. So it's really, it, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat, but I totally agree, but I, I think that's, you know, those folks that are donating to the Harvards and to the Catholic charities, like, I think those are the relationships they're that's it. potentially that's it. that are not that's connecting it. to their community. And there's there's missed opportunities for sure. Yes. I think it's lack of, I agree with you, but I think it's also lack of awareness for the smaller education um, uh, places and agencies, whatever you want to call it. I and mean, we're not, I mean, all your basically not the property. We're the agency that does education as well. We need the money. Well, I think having opportunities like this, and you know, where you can make these connections, yeah. and you know, we're all sharing in resources, and we're not maybe you know grabbing the same ones, but we're helping each other instead of duplicating. I think that's where the progress is going to happen. Yes. I also believe that um, I believe that. There are a lot of organizations who are connecting with companies, and it, outside of their treasure, they're more or less donating their time and their talent. Exactly. So when you're dealing with time, talent, and treasure, um, it's you can't a, a nonprofit cannot exist without all three. Right. But many of them are ready to connect with us. I know we've done our galas, we've done other events. They will want to come and help do the work, yeah. and not necessarily fund like they were funding before. Right. How do you guys like this polling? Love thing? it. Okay. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we kind of touched on this a little bit through our conversation of just how it impacts our particular organizations. So now there's a um, let's see, this activity in your workbook, worksheet. So take a few minutes just to think about the giving landscape of your organization and record those, or, those in your sheet. And that's where I was talking about, you know, where are your current revenues, what are your current revenue sources, what do they, what do they yield, you know, and projecting, giving this landscape that we're talking about, what are some other um, areas of revenue sources that you can think about in the future and what were your hopes to gain from them. And you might just hit yes, you might just hit resend on all the ones that haven't accepted. There's a button there. Don't resend. If you've already accepted, I just, it won't resend. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, cool. Right. My uncle goes over there. I saw it and I was like, so you Awesome. We'll be able to send you everything and we'll be able to send you any activities. And as long as you do that, we will completely honor the certificate just like you were here for yeah. Absolutely. Our pleasure. <laughs> decided if I was going to come down to Florida for a or not, like five years ago, um, it was like minus 20, for two weeks straight. I'm like, we're going to Florida. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, if you're doing oceanographic stuff up there, you have to go to Lake Erie. Yeah. Not the best. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. But a lot of people I know are from like Long Island or Philadelphia area. I thought yeah, that's Long Island is like a huge population. Yeah. So did yeah. anybody come up with any amazing ideas? A bunch of my friends go there actually. Oh really? Yeah. No? It's just like a, it's a town, it's a college. Was this a good exercise to imagine, you know, where your revenue sources are coming from now and looking at where the giving is and how to connect those dots? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and move forward and talk about ethics. I know, Chase, we were going to sneak in a giveaway real quick, but he, yeah. So everybody get your raffle ticket. We're going to What if we spring? Then if no one else claims it, then we assume it's yours. <laughs> Here we go. I'm with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Says it, then we'll go out there. Is that Tracy? Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> so we got two more that we'll do 
As this keeps going, just so we can make sure they're all still. Alright. Great schedule. Great schedule. Do any Saturdays. Do any Saturdays. Do any Saturdays. That's a laptop. No, not a laptop. Uh, not laptops. We sell these on Raffle. We just we happen to have these from past the van job, but oh. how do you raffle? We're setting the bar too high. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. This is your bar. That's good. That's good. So now we're gonna dive into the concept of ethics in fundraising and review some of the examples to help you develop some guidelines. Um, to, so generally we're going to understand the basic tenets of ethics, review a code of conduct, learn the five questions of ethics checklist and how to apply that to some case studies, and delve into further ethics and fundraising via case studies. So what is ethics other than just this general elective that we've all taken in class or you know, this idea of something or when we want to care about it, we care about it, and when we don't, we don't. But, so now again to the polling. We'll just kind of, this will be a fun exercise. So is lying ethical? No. Air, yes or no? We're in a binary world. Ah, <laughs> oh, nice. Hey, we're gonna get there. <laughs> okay. I like how people are changing their answers. You can see the the bar going. <laughs> spare somebody's feelings. Like your mom's meatloaf was amazing. No. I don't want to I don't want to have it again, so I'll say no. She's gonna make it for you every week. No is the right answer. And now it's become your favorite meal. I like how it, as you think about that, you're like, oh, no, no. Spare somebody's feelings, we're, you know, kind of jumping in the gray area. No. <coughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> that is a reason to lie. No. So is it ethical to lie to your children if you're having marital problems, or no, it's not ethical to lie? <laughs> Obviously, we can come up with a million scenarios of when either one of these answers would be appropriate. But just generally to think about. What about Santa Claus? <laughs> oh no, that's the hard one. That's a good day. That's a good day. That's a good day. That's a good answer. That's a good day. Any other thing that you grew up with as a child that was the tooth fairy? I don't think we cared if it was Santa or as long as you got the Yes. 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 Yes.
ethics and you know what story you're telling and how it changes based on the environment or the culture or the experience that you're in and just I think why we started with the why is in our behaviors and our actions constantly tying it back to that point so I think it's almost like our compass you know of, of what's appropriate and what's acceptable in, in our behavior and our initiatives especially when we are the initiatives and, and messages that we're saying are so personal to us you know and what we're asking from other people is so personal mm -hmm. that it's important to really kind of fine-tune you know and be consistent throughout the different experiences that you find yourself in so the three basic tenets, you know, of like what is ethical to ask yourself, you know, the universal code of treat others the way you want to be treated, you know, I'm move forward through my notes here in a second. I'm not good at, at uh, stock stuff, so I just kind of go off the thing and then I want to make sure I cover everything they want me to cover. But generally, the, you know, the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, <coughs> truthfulness, the integrity, you know, your word is your bond, your word, you mean what you, you do what you say you'll do. Um, personal accountability, we choose to live by the attitude and accept personal responsibility for our actions. You know, accepting personal responsibility is a sign of strength, not to mention it elicits trust and respect in other people. And we're all human, you know, it's okay to be human, people connect to that. And then the social media, the whole social media world of everybody posting everything about their lives on social media and, and when you are, you know, you're representing yourself, but you're also representing all the things that you're connected to, all the organizations you're connected to. And what are some of the ways that you can ethically promote yourself you know, you can still be your, you can still have your identity and still be a person and, and represent your organization. So what are some of the things that you guys do to make sure that that's happening, that you're connecting them? Be kind, compassionate towards others, mm -hmm. um, establish trust yeah. with your friends and family. So, that shows. <coughs> um, <coughs> I would say create a, create a safe zone, as in, you know, how we address comments. I think that's one of the issues that I've seen before on social media platforms is um, establishing upfront that we are going to be respectful of people's opinions and different points of views uh, earlier and upfront. And I think it's um, also healthy to kind of stick to the facts, stick to you know things that you are doing well. They don't always have to be you know negative dispositions or displays of uh, projects or. I think certain things are, you know, what's the family motto, what happens in my house stays in my house. <laughs> One of those situations. So oftentimes in our organizations we have to do, we have to manage all of these social media platforms for work. So many years ago I decided to create a separate work account for all of these. So BB Dean is friends with CEOs and funders and all that great fancy stuff with Jack and on, and you know, Dean is friends with her family and has her kids up, and it's, you know, I get to be who I want to be politically on my own platform, and then I get to be who I need to be for work and get my job done, and still connect with everyone that I need to. It's great. How many people have two different personas online? Anybody else? <coughs> oh. You have more. <laughs> Or you, if we're on a personal use platform, what I do is I, um, I separate my platforms. So I have one platform that is open to the public and for personal and per public interpretation. And then I have another completely different platform where I've established um, a larger network over time with longer, you know, with more personal relationships. So that platform is where I kind of, I'm able to share my own opinions and <coughs> critiques be indifferent or not, and then on the public platform, the one that's open for everyone is more of a polished, more more decorum, I'll say. <laughs> a caveat to it that is, uh, I was raised in a military family, so our our whole mentality was, uh, when you 
go anywhere, you represent the military or your branch. And then when I join the Air Force, on base, off base, you're always representing the Air Force, representing <coughs> that when you're in the workplace. So I use that same model that whether it's on social media or it's in work or at home, I'm the same person with my trademark as my smile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. It is. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Hi, everyone. Um, my background, I'm an image consultant. So my specialty is not only how we project ourselves in the world, but also in social media. That's like why now is a huge part of it. And how are we um, a product of our brand? So whatever it is that you want to promote, you become like the spokesperson. So when the way that I relate to others, um, yes, I'm Maria Jacobo. I'm a they call me in the Latino world the doctor of fashion and branding. <laughs> But because I fix people. <laughs> but then I happen to have in my Instagram account um, the things that I have founded or that I partnered with. Regardless, I'm you know, part of Copy, which we have a separate identity that explains who we are. But as a person, these are the things that I endorse. So how do I use it? I use social media to inform others because it's actually a community. We build a community. This is the thing that I like, this is the thing that I support, and this is the why I support it. And it has really helped. Right now, my personal account is probably like around 6,000 people, but then half is is 7,000, 8,000 people because of the need. And my, uh, I open another one called Artism Expo, because we're doing now at Art uh, with Autism and Expo, because we basically have um, more, um, put our effort into technology and avionics. And that is sorry. The minute I opened that, people are writing me from all over the world, trying to find out how can they expose their art. So just a small conversation in social media can connect you with people right now from England, Canada, um, France, I'm, I'm feeling French. So the Caribbean, of course, I, the obvious, because I'm from the Dominican Republic and Canada, so my, my families are connected there. So, yes, <laughs> so I heard they and there are the many <laughs> Good. Yeah, there I am. So, um, so this is how we connect through social media. It's fast, and, and a lot of people don't do it. Millennials, my followers are between 35 and 45, the majority of it, because they're so interested in knowing these topics. I'm having, I have a brother, or I have a this, or I have that. So creating a conversation is not because we need to have a presence, but actually following back with your community is very important. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, it's an interesting topic because you know the organizations that we work with or and partner with, I mean, they reach out to us individually because of our networks yes. a lot of times. And so trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between the relationships that you've built and I think that's why, again, the why is so important because, you know, you don't want to get engaged with an organization that is not something that is um, part of your particular mission. So, um, and then I think, if, again, if you're asking these questions to yourself, um, like, you know, the ethics and all these things that kind of come in, come in line with it, if it's all part of your why, then there's really no gray area between your social media because it's, it's connected to who you are anyway. How do you think this is going to impact us moving forward? As is it social media or ethics? Which or both? Connect both. I, I think they're hand in love with each other, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you start with. Um, if you don't have, without an ethical social media platform, there's no credibility. Let's start with that. Uh, if you don't have ethics in your organization, why do you have an organization? Uh, it would be by two premises, plain and simple, just like that. Uh, authenticity, integrity, honesty, ethics, call it what you will, but they, they go hand in glove. If you can't represent with your heart and soul what you're doing, yeah. don't do it. Can you pass it behind you? I think that social media is only going to be a bigger and bigger part of our organizations 
from registering online through a swipe up link or anything that's easy. And I don't think that, you know, especially the younger generation, their computers, when we have people register online for the events, the biggest phone call I get is, I tried to register for your event, but it's not working. And my first question is always, are you on a tablet or an iPhone? Because a lot of organizations, when they're not a huge entity, we just don't have that yet, and we're, and we're getting there, but I think social media is just gonna be a bigger and bigger part of every organization, and it's about not only just putting content out there for content's sake, but putting content that matters, that's gonna resonate with your donors, because we see in our, so and we're way, way behind any social media organization, but we see, like, when we post a picture from an event, that's great, but when there's a call to action in one of our posts, we see so much more engagement versus mm -hmm. just showing them what we do versus this is what we're doing and this is how you can help. We get so many more click-throughs and likes and people clicking the links when we put something out there like that versus just you know showing off. Yeah, and then you know the responsibility that we have because now we have so much more connectivity. Now we have access to these what would before been anonymous folks until they show up to an event, but now you know where they log, where they work, where they logged in from, and now you have this access to this distribution list and how to ethically and responsibly communicate with them, and really thinking about that instead of you know bombarding them with you know generic emails or things like that, and just being more thoughtful about that connection and what that means. <coughs> So the, back to the every company needs, every organization needs to have ethical standards <coughs> of conduct. Does your organization have one? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it just helps employees know how to handle sensitive situations. Megan, just really quickly. Yeah. For fear of sounding embarrassed, if an organization Never. doesn't have one, where might they go to get started? So there is an example here. Sorry. No, and then in your workbook, you're, you're just like a ringer in the audience. <laughs> so in the workbook too, there's gonna, there, we're going to talk about um, drafting your core values and, and then how that can relate to or how it can or does relate to your code of ethics and standards. So the five question ethics checklist, you know, is it legal, is it ethical, would I want someone else to act this way to me, how would I explain my actions to someone else, and how will, I make my, how will it make me feel better. Actually I have fast forward, let me pause, go back to the code of uh, conduct. And on your worksheet, on your worksheet, there is a section that I was talking about, about your core values of your organization. How can you apply these values to your code of conduct if you do or don't have one? Um, and then any kind of ethical concerns that you have within your <coughs> particular industry or, or niche with your organization. So take a couple minutes to think about that. Um, in Canvas, there is um, two or three examples of a code of conduct. So if your company or organization does not have one, you can kind of look at other. <coughs> other options of what they include. But generally, you know, you, you want to address, like, what are some of the common minor offenses that must be reported? How often should employees report ethical concerns and to whom? How are these concerns addressed formally, informally, or not at all? And are the employees familiar with the ethical guidelines? Where is it in Canvas? In Canvas under um, Session 1. It'll have, it has a ethical activities, ethics activities. They're online too. Go under modules. Thank you. 
Yeah. So ethics discussion and activity. It has the code of conduct, the handout, and the standards there. Okay. If you guys click on anything and you can't get to it, just let me know. And it's because obviously I click on it and it opens, and so I don't realize you guys are having any problems. Um, and so we need permissions thing. So for me, as well. okay. Unauthorized. Huh. unauthorized as well. Okay, for the for this particular. Okay. Just download it and upload it and set it so it's not a link, so you don't have to get to it. You can see it as a student? Okay. I, I don't want anybody to suffer in silence, so like I don't want you to be, you know, home somewhere else and, and frustrated that you can't get the access that you need, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have problems, okay? So this is not something that you need to com totally complete right now, but as I mentioned earlier, this is a step to really you know, honing in and, and identifying the values of your organization and how it relates to everything else that we've discussed, and as well as if you're going to put your fundraising strategic plan together, this is a huge component of that too. Right. Anybody have questions about the code of conduct? I'll make sure you have access to all that. Yes, I, I just want to say, and it's just been troubling me. So it's not only for employees, but it's also for board members. And yes. I trust that we'll talk about that because that, the board members being the face have to understand the ethical side of working in the nonprofit. Yeah, we're going to have a good guest speakers talking about that relationship too with the board, which is extremely important. All right, so the next checklist. Now, in your Workbook 2, there's a handout that looks like this. So pull that out. And it lists the questions at the top as well as the five ethics checklists to think about. So go through each of these case studies. You can work together or you can, you know, I think it's good if you just group up, maybe four or five of you group up together and just go through the case studies and these checklists and then we'll kind of go over it together in a few minutes. Sound good? Yes, that sounds great. Sound good. They turn the air off in here too.
they change their arm probably with me. <laughs> um, they have it all explained that I should be someone else because you know about what she did. This is what we're doing now, right? It's a gray area. Uh, and then how it how it made me feel about myself. So like I said, I came to my position bringing my turn and you know, to the goal. So I and now I those contacts are also but they were already yours, you called them out. Yeah. But the other thing, too, is, as you said, that the primary decision is to the organization. Yes, the military nature of the stone is gone. They want to stay in touch. 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 strategic plan. So the outline generally, you know, what we've covered today is this organizational overview and highlights. So again, the, the, the entire plan includes the program or service accomplishments, needs, and growth, the budget and financial forecast for the program, um, the uh, long-term funding needs for the program, and perspective, you know, part of the organizational overview or who are, what's your current 
giving landscape or your donor down. That's why we did that part of the workbook. And then number six is prospecting out of you know the other areas of revenue sources and relationships and industries in which you can collaborate and work with. And then the final would be the strategy, the fundraising strategy and project plan. So the, again, the sponsoring organizations will be developing this for your organization, and you'll have this at the end of the eight weeks. But part of this is like, how does this really tie in? How does it make sense? You know, what do, these are all very academic kind of things. You know, how does it make sense to my particular organization? And that's why we're incorporating the live case study, and Sal's gonna talk about both kids in relationship to developing these particular deliverables. So you can keyboard or... Okay, uh, thank you. As I mentioned before, uh, my professional background is in uh, public sector and nonprofits. And one of the things that um, is very important to me, I mentioned that during my career I had to um, basically restore uh, organizations. They were bankrupt uh, and some of them were just in disarray. So one of the things that uh, I was able to do was to go in there and actually um, reconstitute them in many ways. Uh, and the thing that I was I'm most proud of, I worked with Yale University, I worked with, uh, obviously, City of Pittsburgh, where I, where I worked at, uh, Nassau County, uh, Miami Dade, and other organizations. And one of the things, uh, as a budget professional, finance uh, person, uh, is that I really try to understand their, fin their financial position. What drove the revenue? Uh, what were the assumptions that, uh, that drove the revenue? Why were some revenue uh, revenue sources increasing, why were some of them were decreasing? And not only that, but then how did that then tie into the organization itself in terms of its service delivery, in terms of the outcomes that were being expected, its understanding its financial position. And working with nonprofits, one of the things that, um, that I um, am concerned about is that there's a tendency for nonprofits not to assess their work so that you don't understand what are the key, key performance indicators in many cases. Uh, some nonprofits do not have the have the the personnel to do a thorough revenue analysis uh, of the revenue structure, uh, which revenue should be increased. And this I'm doing this because it ties to the activity that we had earlier. Uh, and so, and then also comments that you made about as a consultant. So I've been as a consultant as well, helping out organizations. And so one of the things that I want to do uh, with this live case study. Now I mentioned uh, Karen Prescott and Tracy Prescott, uh, Taylor Prescott. Uh, and also Jeanette Taylor, not a Prescott, but Taylor. <laughs> uh, they also they also sit on on the advisory board, uh, as well as Michael, uh, your as his executive over at the uh, Jewish Federation. And so one of the one of the good things about having a, a live case study is that everything that we learn that we talk about in in the sort of the topics before we get here is that I try to actually then apply those to an actual case study. There are, I have students, I have consultants, I have. Uh, individuals uh, like Roxanne, for example, who's going to transfer, who wants to become an executive director. She has skills, and how can those skills then be transferred over to the nonprofit sector? I have Flavia, who works in the private sector, who needs sort of, okay, so how do we do this revenue analysis stuff? And I said, well, that's great, because I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, and so there's a lot of different skill sets here and different skill levels. Uh, and some folks are very good at one particular thing. Uh, but uh, what I want to do, why, why am I doing this? Go back to the earlier question, why? Uh, why is because I want to make sure that you have the skills as you progress in the nonprofit sector, as you move up to the, the ladder, that you have those skills that you need so that you become more efficient, more effective, and you also transform your organization. Right? Because if your organization isn't growing, then that's not a good thing. Not growing in terms of revenue, but not growing in terms of services, understanding your client. So if you're, having, if you're going through demographic changes, how can you assess your target population? To meet the, the needs that are that are the new needs that are occurring because of the demographic changes occurring, so I'm looking at it in a more holistic way uh, because that's how I view things. Uh, as a finance director, I just didn't look at finances. I looked at how it impacts every organization that I oversaw. What does that mean for my for my staff? What does that mean for other employees in the organization? How can I harness their skills to help the organization in general? Right? Because it's not just the finance guy doing it; it's everyone collectively. So that's why we, uh, we chose um, Bowtie Kids, uh, and also uh, Dan Recruiter and Jake Jones's organization, My Life, My Power. My power. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we have an example of how to do it. 
right? Illustrate the content of fundraising essentials and meeting current and future needs. That we're going to go through very systematically with, um, with um, Education Rocks and also with Bow Tie Kids. And yes, the reason why I'm wearing this bow tie is I'm representing uh, her, her nonprofit. Uh, Sherry asked, are you guys going to wear bow ties all the way through? Yes, I am. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you have bow ties, bring them. <clears throat> This is, this is actually one that you tie, not a clip-on. <laughs> I, can, I can show you, but then, you know, it'll ruin the, the quality of the, of the lecture. All right. And again, we're applying everything that, all the topics we're applying to a live case study. This is how we're going to do it. Now, for those of you who are not students and don't have a deliverable, I would, uh, if you want to go through the exercise and then create a, a project while you're here, that's fine. Uh, you, can, you obviously can do that. Um, but for the students, um, this is something that, that's a good learning experience for them. And the other thing I want to emphasize is that every template that I develop in terms of the Excel and everything else, I will share that with all of you. Uh, I'm, especially when it comes to the financial, financial forecast. I know I have Eduardo Fajardo, who's a, uh, a treasurer. Uh, you're the um, finance guy? Chief of Chief of, okay. So, what, and so that, so, no, that's important. So, the reason why I'm going to do that is that one of the things that, uh, remember, I said I worked in government that, that, that were in bad condition, uh, is because they never took the time to do the actual financial forecasting. Here are our expenditures, how's this, how they're growing, how can we get our revenue to grow at, at a faster rate than our expenditures. And the other case, for example, you have, which I'm going to go through here, is that you have the potential to grow your revenue. If you have the potential to grow your revenue, then how does that translate into your organization in terms of expanding 